What's really interesting, we've had a big focus today on infection prevention and control and also I think on the use of prescribing. Um, but what you're going to hear in this last session is how important diagnostics is to that whole journey as well. And I have a real pleasure of um, introducing Cordo and Matt, who's going to join me later on. But first of all, I'm going to set the scene and tell you a little bit about the work that we're leading nationally within NHS England um, with the UK AMR Diagnostic Collaborative. So I'm Fiona Carraher, I am the Deputy Chief Scientific Officer for England, based in NHS England. Um, I'm a biochemist by background. I spent the majority of my um, working life being in laboratories, um, mainly in London, um, but, in, um, but in other parts of the country, including um, Edinburgh. Um, the reason that this work sits with us is that we lead the healthcare science profession. About 50,000 scientists that work in the NHS um, often a hidden profession, but working in pathology and genetics and genomics, physics and engineering, through to physiology and our bioinformatics. Now, we've heard today how there is a national strategy um, led by um, Dame Sally Davis that sets out what the UK needs to do to really tackle the challenge of antimicrobial resistance. And the strategy um, was launched in 2013, and it's actually, um, we're in a live process of refreshing that strategy. But in 2013, diagnostics were mentioned, but actually it was quite a, a passing mention, um, thinking about how we needed to develop new diagnostics to really tackle this challenge. But things have changed quite dramatically in the last um, year to 18 months, and, and not least with the um, independent review of antimicrobial resistance that was led by uh, Lord O'Neill. And he came out really firmly saying that actually... It's not, it's not just about prescribing, it's not just about infection prevention and control. We're missing a real trick if we're not thinking about the use of diagnostics in this space. Because diagnostics are critical to really drive the appropriate use of antimicrobials. And actually, this st a step change in the way in which we use technology needs to be used and actually incorporating it into decision-making processes. Because as we know, and actually as we've heard throughout today, many clinical decisions are made on the basis of an empirical diagnosis currently. And we know that currently there are some rapid point-of-care diagnos diagnostics that we're going to hear from <coughs> colleagues later, but actually there's more of these coming on the market. And these are going to be able to enable us to make precise and timely diagnosis. And that, used within a decision support approach, can actually lead to appropriate use of the antimicrobials. And Jim O'Neill gave us a really tough challenge. He said, actually, by 2020, we shouldn't be prescribing if there is a diagnostic test available. That's the challenge that he set out to all the governments. Now, I've been a diagnostician since um, the 1990s. Um, and I would say very clearly that diagnostics are the signalling system for the NHS. Because what it's able to do is direct patients and patient flow so that actually they get the, the right treatment at the right place in the pathway. So we know that by the use of diagnostics, it can ensure that treatment and, and management is efficient, is effective and coordinated. And we also know that diagnostics enable us to you know, really prioritise our activities, that services are resilient and sustainable for the future and can actually enable us to really shape the health economic, economics of particular patient pathways. So we need to think about diagnostics as those critical signalling systems. And in the AMR agenda, diagnostics can be used in a whole host of ways, telling us whether it's bacterial or viral, telling us what type of bacteria it is, is it resistant, what antibiotics can't I use, is it susceptible, which should I use? but also recognising that there's a real um, opportunity for using biomarkers and host response, and we're going to hear about some of those from um, colleagues later. Now, again, we heard this set out from um, colleagues this morning about what the national ambitions are set out by the UK government, about halving gram-negative um, healthcare-acquired infections by 50% by 2020, also to halve inappropriate prescribing <coughs> in humans by 2020, but there are also very clear ambitions set out about animal use of antibiotics and also about what we need to do on a global and international scale. And a number of things have changed over the last year, not least the establishment of four national programmes um, to really meet these challenges. 
Ruth May, you heard from this morning, is leading the work around infection prevention and control. Human optimised prescribing is led by Dr Keith Ridge, who's the chief pharmacist within NHS England. Our colleagues within um, the veterinary medicine department at DEFRA are leading on improved animal use, and we, as the chief scientific officer, are leading on the use of diagnostics. And underpinning all this are real improvements that we need to have around education and training, particularly of our healthcare professionals, but also what we need to do around surveillance, about behavioural and evidence-based interventions. And finally, thinking about the innovation piece, what do we need to do around discovery, innovation and global action? So we have set out a clear strategy around the UK AMR diagnostics, and this is really, at its simplest way, about putting diagnostics at the right test at the right place in that care pathway. And this could be, in the future, anything from self-care and self-monitoring right through to what do we have on the high street, in pharmacies and other settings, through to primary and community care, right through to secondary care, and not, not least our public health colleagues and what's needed for surveillance. But to do all of this, it needs to be linked through integrated data sharing. And I can tell you this, and I know my colleagues will say the same, that's not easy. That's not easy when we think about diagnostics, how we're coding diagnostics, how we're measuring, are we measuring the same thing? So actually we have linked data throughout this whole pathway. <coughs> so I'm really pleased to um, bring to you today the UK AMR Diagnostic Collaborative, which was established um, at the tail end of 2017. And although we're leading for within NHS England, I think there's two clear points here. The first is that it's UK wide. So uh, we have the privilege of working with our colleagues within the devolved administrations. And also is that it is a collaborative. This is a very clear point, really important, that it's all about how we work together on this, how we bring all of the expertise that we have. We have a number of key areas of focus, the first being around um, clinical pathways. So we're working with the NIHR um, MedTech Innovation Collaboratives, the mix, to look at the economic and uh, valuation of diagnostics within care pathways, particularly thinking about, in the first instance, urinary tract infections and respiratory tract infections. So the work that these, the, these, these groups are doing for us is not only looking at the economic, the, the, the value-based um, case for diagnostics, but also helping us understand where the gaps are. Now, what do we need? And that can help stimulate innovation in that place. We're doing a lot of work on diagnostic stewardship, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a moment, um, and as well as around innovation, so make sure that we are thinking about that whole innovation pipeline. But the other piece to note is that this is not just about human health. There's real opportunities to use diagnostics in the animal health agenda, and there's some real um, opportunities to learn from actually some of the point-of-care testing they're using out in the field, and I mean out in a field with an animal in front of them, but actually some of the, the kind of approaches that they're taking to robust technology being used in that different approach. And underpinning all this is working with our system partners, Public Health England, Health Education England, and of course, and um, DEFRA from, uh, from the veterinary side. So it's really interesting from some of the work that we heard earlier and obviously from Matt this morning around um, sepsis, really thinking about diagnostic stewardship as being that third pillar with IPC and with the, the prescribing agenda to really how we move forward with this challenge around AMR. Now as somebody who's worked nearly all their um, uh, professional career within the laboratories, I think quite simply about what we need to do in the lab, and that's, that can be just about how we test, how quickly we get things turned around, how we get the results out. But when we think about diagnostic stewardship, and I think this is a challenge for us working in the laboratories, we need to think about the whole end-to-end -end pathway, right from getting, you know, getting the sample collected correctly, making sure it's getting to the laboratory on time, do we need to actually put our tests out, in, out, out of the laboratory? Then thinking about what we're doing in the lab, thinking about the technology that we're doing, thinking about the process that we have so that we are timely in our results. And finally, how those results are used, how they're reported, how they're acted upon. And again, some of the things that we've heard themes through today are how it's important that we have these multi-professional teams so everybody is working together on the same agenda. 
I have the privilege of leading the diagnostic stewardship work with Professor Neil Woodford, who is an international expert on antimicrobial resistance within PHE. And over the last few weeks with our, our working group of, of experts, we've agreed three clear priorities. The first is around the use of biomarkers, things like CRP and procalcitonin, thinking about the use of point of care testing out in the community setting. The second is around the sepsis pathway. How do we get much better at the at, at blood culturing, getting the results into the getting the samples into the laboratory, getting the results turned around, you know, making sure that we're timely and those results are acted upon. And the third piece is around urinary tract infections and really looking to see what those opportunities to use diagnostics or not to use them in terms of to dip or not to dip can be done. But we know that there's enormous amounts of opportunities for new diagnostics. And I have to say, um, as a scientist, it is very exciting to be a scientist at that time. There is a technology explosion you know, as we speak. We see that we've got opportunities to use lap on, lap on a chip. You've got handheld use of smartphones. Where's that going to take us in the future? What can point of care testing be done? You know, taking, those, taking the testing out of the laboratory we know there's going to be issues around quality control, about um, training, but actually there's a, that's something that we need to embrace. And then finally, thinking about the genomics revolution, what's going to happen with these high throughput genomic technologies? Where's that going to take us in the future? And I think to do all of this and to embrace all of, and to embrace all of this and to really get the gains that we can have from diagnostics, we need to work together. There's absolutely no doubt about this. This is about how we work with our academics, how we in the NHS work with our patients, work with our industry colleagues, um, and looking internationally for what we can learn. Because we know that some of the most disruptive technology may come from lower middle income countries, where they're having to do things completely differently and within their own environments. So we need to work together, and that's why we very clearly set out our work as a collaborative. So across that whole innovation pipeline, from great idea, invention, through how we evaluate it, through to how do we adopt it at scale, we're all working to the same end. And then really, just to finish before I introduce um, my colleagues, you know, we've got huge opportunities and huge challenges um, around the use of diagnostics in this space. Our challenges mean that we've really got to think differently about some of the pathways. This is going to take a step change, I think, in some of the ways in which we deliver our diagnostic provision. And to do that, we know we've got huge challenges in commissioning of diagnostics currently. And certainly in England, much of diagnostics is hidden from commissioning. It's, it, it's, it's bundled up into other care pathway um, commissioning um, arrangements. So it's very difficult to unpick and be innovative in this space. We've got a lot to do around robust quality of data, and it's fantastic to see where they are with the prescribing data. And where I'd like to be in terms of a holy grail would be to have diagnostic data that overlays that prescribing data. We're a long way from that. There's work to be done. And we also know that we've got, you know, we're going to have to be keeping up with the microbes, with the bugs, in terms of the constant evolution there. And, and technology is going to have to keep pace. But I am an optimist, and I do think that we've got real opportunities from taking um, diagnostics in this space. Really thinking about those next generation diagnostics to give us that precise and timely diagnosis. Thinking, about, thinking differently about where we use our diagnostics, and actually thinking about our greater use of other professionals in this space. And then learning from what's, what's worked well within other programmes, such as the use of sequin um, and other um, national levers that we can do. So I just wanted to leave you with a, a final thought. The NHS constitution, which sets out why we work in the NHS, talks, talks about work, working at the limits of science. And I think we've got a real opportunity with diagnostics to make that step change within antimicrobial resistance. So thank you. And I think we're going to hear from Cordo next, hopefully. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona, and thanks for the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, not only because presenting to this great audience, but also co-presenting with my colleague, Matt, Martin Adakim, who is very generous. He said to me, Kordo, you could take as much as you like with the presentation. Um, so I think we have next 45 minutes. Yeah. Or so. yeah? OK. So the title of the pre presentation is Biomarkers, an integration of biomarkers 
into antibiotic stewardship program or decision making, uh, whether to admit patients or avoid admission. And hopefully prognosis, have an idea about a prognosis of, of, of patients when they attend uh, hospitals. I'm a microbiologist, clinical microbiologist by background. Uh, I work in Hampshire Hospitals, NHS Foundation Trust, and I also teach at the university. Um, so whenever we face a, a patient in ED or elsewhere, clinical presentation um, plus some biomarkers, some tests that we do, and you could divide roughly these tests or markers into traditional, which you see white cell CRP, culture, lactate, interleukins, uh, and some novel markers, uh, procalcitonin, proadrenomodulin, um, DREM1, preceptin. If I am presenting this talk somewhere in Switzerland, I would move the procalcitonin to the traditional side because it's been widely used in Europe as a marker of bacterial infection and also been integrated more than us in the UK into the antibiotic stewardship program and the decision making about whether to give antibiotics or not, uh, especially uh, in ED and in ICU. Um, this is probably, you have had many of these challenges uh, throughout the day. Fiona alluded to some of, of, of these. Some of our current challenges is sepsis recognition. Um, I always say to the juniors, we are very clever when we know what we're dealing with. When we know this is infection, we will give antibiotics, or when we have a positive blood culture, and we know this is not an infection, but the gray area, the just-in-case one, is very challenging, and Matt could tell you more about it. Uh, and the sepsis definitions, uh, clinical scoring, some of them could be time-consuming, non-sensitive, non-specific, or too sensitive and non-specific. Triaging, uh, admission avoidance, an ill-looking well patient. So those are the challenges. Someone looking well, but they're really ill. Or someone is looking ill, but they're really well. So avoiding early admission in those ones. Also triaging to ICU, HDU, avoid admission completely. Um, identifying patients with mild infection it's very challenging, especially knowing which patient of those mild infections would progress to develop severe sepsis, septic shock, uh, who potentially could have higher mortality. <clears throat> antibiotic stewardship, you heard in the previous session, avoiding unnecessary use of antibiotics, the just-in-case one. I mean, I'm a clinician, I show you some data. Uh, um, Matt also could, could confirm. We do give antibiotics just in case. Uh, when we don't know if, a, if this is infection or not. But the safe practice is to give the antibiotic, just in case this is an infection that we could cure, um, hopefully with this antibiotic. And then the challenge of the rapid, not just rapid, rapid accurate diagnostics for bacterial infection. Ideally a diagnostics that could tell us this is a bacterial infection, not just in the UK, but somewhere like in South Sudan in the middle of the field, as veterinary colleagues use it. So that's very important, because antibiotic resistance is a global issue. Misuse of antibiotics, unnecessary antibiotics, is a global issue. So I'm going to talk about, predominantly, personal experience in Hampshire hospitals about procalcitonin and proadrenomodulin. Pro PCT for procalcitonin and pro-ADM for proadrenomodulin. And the reason why we became interested in procalcitonin, uh, we started using it since 2009, uh, procalcitonin, by the way, and since then is, is in MAU, medical admission unit in ICU, and now we are using it uh, regularly across two major sites. Uh, apart from pediatrics, we probably use it ev everywhere else in the hospital. Yeah. And the reason for our interest is because there are various reports about 20 to 50% of antibiotics in human health could be avoidable and necessary. And there are some data, American, there's some data in the UK and elsewhere. And unnecessary use of antibiotics, it's directly associated with increasing bacterial resistance, selection pressure, toxicity and interactions. Most of our patients um, are elderly with polypharmacy, 
um, interactions, so more side effects, more toxicity. And it's really costly. Um, based on BNF prices, a seven-day course of antibiotics in our medical admission units is about 250 pounds for seven days. This is based on BNF prices. So 80, 89 pounds. In ICU, 250 pounds. So hugely expensive. This is just the antibiotic itself. I'm not talking about the hidden costs that are associated with antibiotics, which could be up to 100% or more of the antibiotic cost itself. So this is just in case antibiotic. This is a survey. Uh, I did this survey for intensivists and infectiologists, infection specialists, microbiologists, infectious diseases. How often we give antibiotic just in case? Do we give antibiotic just in case? This is Survey Monkey. Uh, whoever told you Survey Monkey is confidential, it's not true. You could find out who gave the answers. <laughs> and I didn't know that until I did the survey, and a colleague of mine didn't respond to the survey. And I said, Why? Did you respond? You say no, because survey monkey is not confidential. And I said, how come? It's confidential. I don't know the answer. And he showed me the answers, who provided the, these answers. And the people who said no, they don't give antibiotics just in case. I have worked with them, and I know they have done. <laughs> <laughs> so we all do antibiotic, give antibiotics just in case. Some of us do it on a daily basis, some of it weekly, and, and so on. So trying to reduce the amount of the just-in-case antibiotics. That was the original idea for using procalcitonin. And why we chose procalcitonin is because based on the data that we have, it's more sensitive, more specific for bacterial infection um, than other markers. This is, um, it's produced by the C cell, procalcitonin cell, by the C cell of the thyroid. Um, in healthy individuals, here. I don't know if there's a pointer. Yeah. So healthy individuals, C cells and liver cells, uh, sorry, lung cells produce procalcitonin. But if you challenge a mammal, human, rats, whatever, almost every single tissue in the body starts to produce procalcitonin. And that production doesn't happen when you have an interferon gamma pathway, the viral immunology pathway, rather than the interleukins and the tumor necrotic factor alpha. So that's why the sensitivity and sensitivity is, is better for bacterial infection. What's the role of procalcitonin in healthy individuals? Some say it's maintain vascular tone or acts as a neurotransmitter, but nobody exactly knows. The role in infection, nobody knows. But if you induce sepsis in animals and you give them NT procalcitonin antibodies, survival is 100%, whether you give it as early as you can in the process of sepsis or in the pre-morbid stage. So it could have some therapeutic effect, the antibody to procalcitonin. And this is just to show you, there's a paper from Lancet ID a few years ago, um, sensitivity, specificity, Positive predictive value, negative predictive value for bacterial infection and sepsis is far more superior than the CRP. And we still use CRP to make decisions on a daily basis. Another reason for its attractiveness, here times zero, if you introduce a bacteria or lipopolysaccharide, within a few hours, procalcitonin would go up. Within six to 12 hours, it peaks. And if you correct that infection to decline, within 24 hours, dramatically. CRP takes about 12 hours just to rise, and then takes 24, 48 hours to decline, and then takes longer to, to, to come down. Um, <coughs> these seems attractive, but Fiona, as biochemist, tell you the challenges, why we don't measure interleukins and tumor necrotic factor. Um, difficult to define a cutoff, and also they're very labile, so they degrade very quickly, so you need to do it very, the test very quickly. Some data from this uh, uh, paper. Um, as you see, the procalcitonin bacterial infection goes up nicely, but doesn't go up in viral infection, so that's uh, an, another attractiveness of the test. Uh, so we wanted to reduce the just-in-case antibiotics. 
We had a meeting with our colleagues, Matt and intensivists in, in, in our hospital. Um, we decided if we are going to give antibiotic just in case, let's do the test. And if it's below certain cutoff, we withhold antibiotics and monitor the patient, see what happens to them. If all well, that's fine. If not, still not sure, we could repeat the test and see whether it's gone up or down the trend. Uh, we had some inclusion exclusion criteria. At that time, 2009-10 was based on the SERS, so two or more SERS, but you are not sure if this is infection or not, you include. We excluded patients who are immunosuppressed, pregnant ladies, neonates. We exclude patients with true positive microbiology, like someone with positive blood culture. We didn't know didn't need it to the test because we would have treated regardless of the test results. And we used these cutoffs based on a wide range of pu publications. So in MAU, in MATS unit, 0.25 microgram per liter, uh, we, if the clinician suspects an infection or not sure, we give antibiotic. Anything below that, we withhold antibiotic. Same patient in ICU, 0.5. As you can see, pancreatitis four microgram per liter, because some inflammation could lead to rise of procalcitonin physiologically. Postoperative patient, again, trauma could lead to increase in procalcitonin uh, so within 48 hours. But the clinicians always have the right to ignore the test. And the rate of ignoring the test in our hospital is about 11% based on the latest audit we did, which is lower than uh, some international data. Patient followed up for seven days at least, because seven days we thought was a good time for an infection to declare itself. In ICU, we monitored them daily through our daily ward route. And this is the data we, we, we saw. So out of 100 patients, 50% of the time, we avoided antibiotics. That's just the in case. 33% um, patients got antibiotic. At that time, 14, patient, 14 times, the, the, so 14%, the test was ignored. But the key message is here, 50% of the just-in-case antibiotics were avoided without adverse effects on the patients, so no mortality, no infection. And these patients didn't have a course of antibiotic within that seven days that we followed them up. In ICU, on average, in MAU, we had one test per patient. In ICU, average, two tests per patient. And still, 50% of the time, resulted in avoiding or withholding antibiotics. So that was equal to one out of six antibiotic prescriptions in our hospitals, in MAU and in ICU, one out of six courses. So that's 17% reduction in antibiotics. Use that time to calculate. Procalcitonin, which is better in detecting potentially infected versus non-infected patients, um, my animation doesn't work here, so I do apologize. So here, a patient in ICU, the blue bar is non-infected, the red is infected. These are CRPs from patients' data, almost identical. White cell count, almost identical. Look at the piece procalcitonin, 0.4 compared to 5.5, so a large difference. Predicting infection. These are postoperative patients, pseudomyxoma patients, uh, the line hasn't appeared. So there should be a gray line here. This is postoperative patient for patients who didn't develop infection, procalcitonin level. For those who developed infection, we diagnosed clinically the infection here. The procalcitonin detected it almost 24 hours before the clinical suspicion. CRP for 24 hours after. White cell count, normal change. But the nice thing about procalcitonin was the infection control came down nicely to the normal levels. So again, reassuring stopping antibiotics sooner in those cases, rather than carrying on. As in this case. So again, these are septic patients in ICU. So we started antibiotics here. This is CRP, normal changed day five, day three. White cell count, normal change but the procalcitonin coming down nicely, so we are on the right track of, 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 of uh, the right antibiotics, right course. And we stopped the antibiotics sooner here. If we had based the decision on the CRP, we probably would have carried on. 
So I say 17% reduction, that was equal to 15,000 just from antibiotic cost itself. That would be doubled if you add the hidden costs of antibiotics uh, just for six month period. So you could calculate that for annually or uh, over the years. But most importantly, I mean, the cost is very important. Patients were not exposed to unnecessary antibiotics. Bed days potentially were saved, IV lines, uh, secondary bacterial infections, C. difficile were prevented. So we cannot calculate those benefits from what we have done. So those, those are our local data. If you are more interested, that's real live data that we have, non-randomized. These are patients coming in and we do these tests. But if you're interested in randomized, studies or systematic reviews, there's a huge amount of data. This is just from ED data, random, uh, systematic reviews on ED data. Again, they showed uh, reduction in antibiotic use in adults, not necessarily pediatrics, uh, uh, reduce of exposure to antibiotic, reduce of exposure to side effects of antibiotics. Um, as you see here, 20%, the clinician 20% of the time ignored the, the test. Um, more recently, data from ICUs. So this ICUs in, in Holland, they divided patient into a procalcitonin arm and standard of care. For the first time, not only reduction in antibiotic use, reduction in length of stay, for the first time they showed improved in survival. All previous other studies, including our one, we haven't seen increased mortality, but here, they showed increased survival, better survival, if you use biomarkers to aid your antibiotic decision making. This group calculated the cost of procalcitonin to be cost effective as four euros. Uh, at the moment, some pay 10 pound per test, some pay 20 pound per test. And again, end of last year, for respiratory tract infection, whether in ICU or wards, ED, or even in GP practices, a reduction in mortality, significant reduction in mortality across all the disciplines. This is for respiratory tract infection. And also PCD guided reduction in an exposure to antibiotics by two to four days. And also reduction in the side effects of antibiotics if you use procalcitonin. They couldn't calculate the cost uh, in, in, the, in this review. <clears throat> Some data suggest that procalcitonin could be a marker for prognosis, outcome. So this group, this is ICU data. If they, they say if your procalcitonin level, despite adequate treatment with antibiotic adequate source control, if your level's still above one microgram per litre, it should be undetectable in health individuals. Your mortality is 100%. Philip Schutz, who is who's a a Swiss clinician with uh, experience, high, high level experience for calcitonin, he said, no, it has to be not just staying above one microgram. You have to have 75 or 80 percent reduction within three days of the original value that predicts survival. We haven't seen that with our patients. Um, so this is data on procalcitonin day zero and day three for about 60 patients who attended ED in Hampshire hospitals with true bacteremia. Most of them are gram-negative E. coli, uh, some staph aureus. Patients who had high procalcitonin and died, we noticed 75% reduction. Despite that, they died. Um, patients with low procalcitonin and sepsis continuously, those are the ones who survived. So the reduction, the 75% reduction, didn't affect the outcome. But we found using proadrenomodulin, which is a relative of procalcitonin, a more novel marker, um, could actually predict mortality better. Um, so if you are proadrenomodulin, there's a traffic light system, uh, low level green, medium increase between 75, 1.5 microgram per, nanomole per litre, and in the red zone if, if you're more than 1.5 nanomole per litre. If you continuously in the red zone, as in these cases, you would die. If you are in the green zone, your survival is more likely. Proadrenomodulin, unlike procalcitonin, is a non-specific marker. Um, it goes up 
with various insults, whether infection or inflammation, hypoxia, nitric oxide. But it tells you how critically ill a person is. If your level, especially if your level is more than 1.5 nanomole per liter. And colleagues from Spain and France, they checked the usage of pro-ADM as a marker of for mortality. And they stratified patients, septic patients, these are patients with severe sepsis and septic shock in ICU into three groups. Those with SOFA less than six, SOFA seven to 12, and SOFA more than 13. This is the challenging area. Very ill, but with low SOFA score. In all groups, proadrenomodulin was far more superior than any other marker for predicting mortality. This is very important for this group because these are the well-looking ill. This is a challenge that we face. We have recognized that one. Once you go to very ill-looking ill, doesn't matter. Any of the markers would show you these patients is probably wouldn't do well. And based on some data we have, over 2,500 patients, most of the ED patients would fall into SOFA score of six or less, the, the ones with infection, or potentially that develop sepsis. So this is a challenge. They also demonstrated not only better predictive for mortality, but um, among the survival, anyone who had pro-adrenomodulin of less than 0.88 nanomole per liter would survive. So if your level less than 0.88, 100% survival. So it could be a marker of survival as well, not just mortality. So we thought, can we replicate this in ED department to help us recognize the ill-looking look, Ill well uh, and also avoid admission, and also whether we could confidently say some of these patients would die, regardless of what we do, what we do to them. So we set up this study, sided study, which has been submit, uh, going to be submitted for publication in the next two weeks. So this is a, a study involving more than 2,500 2, patients. Anyone that comes to ED, so this is not randomized, this is real life again. We collected data, clinical data, news, um, data on CRP, white cell count, procalcitonin, lactate, urea, SOFA, quick SOFA, CURB, 65, CR, so all these data. So it's a huge amount of data. We, um, and um, from at least six or seven centers, UK and European. I cannot tell you more about it, but uh, for prognosis, 28-day mortality, we found, again, pro-ADM using similar cutoffs as the previous one is the best predictor of mortality, and also similar cutoffs, best predictor for survival. What's also interesting is decision to admit a patient or not. I will just tell you this. I cannot go to details. If you had think your safe discharge from your ED is, let's say, 30%, you could double it with the pro-ADM without mortality with less readmissions for the same condition. So I'm optimistic like Fiona. Although the challenges are many, and some of them are big, we have lots of opportunities here to integrate biomarkers, novel biomarkers to clinical score, and novel, novel testing, diagnostic testing. You've probably seen my colleague, Dr. Cortez, uh, in, in the previous sessions about Accelerate, telling us about infection, uh, identification of infection within an hour, and sensitivities within seven hours. There are other technologies, innovate, innovative technology, Cognitor, that could exclude bacteremia very quickly in, in, in patients. So all these could help. So we need to integrate uh, these technology. Progalstonian, as I say, is very, very good for bacterial infection, but it's not has lots of limitation for 
identifying severe tube infection, we need to combine biomarkers, smart biomarkers, specific sensitive biomarkers, measurable, reproducible, readily available, timely, uh, to integrate it, to assist us in accurately identifying ill-looking well, well-looking ill, triaging patients, uh, and avoid admissions. And ideally, these markers should be done, be available everywhere. You could do it at a point of care in a theater or in a GP clinic, uh, inside an ambulance or uh, on the ward. So I'm a clinician, I see patients. Um, I try and use the technology, the evidence. Um, a lot of what I do is based around physiology, judgment, um, and when a test comes along that I can use at point of care and give me a rapid result within 15 minutes, like procalcitonin, like CRP, like lactate, I get really excited. We haven't got pro-ADM, unfortunately, on widespread release yet. We, um, we will. Is it coming? <laughs> it, should, it, it is coming at the point of care. I can't wait. Sorry. <laughs> and, and what it all hinges around for, for me, is, is the kind of balance of, of the light side of the force versus the dark side of the force, really, where we have this intangible situation of wanting to give antibiotics to the right crowd of people, but managing the equipoise of that against resistance. And our desperate, desperate dire need to form or find a sepsis test, something that will give us relatively high sensitivity and specificity without causing everything to get treated. Um, and, and as was described earlier, these two sides of the same coin are probably the best description of all of this. And it's what makes this conference in some ways slightly unique in that it brings together sepsis enthusiasts and people who want to give antibiotics to everyone and antimicrobial specialists and people worried about resistance and forces collaboration and a conversation to begin and the right positioning of both very well-meaning, very important work streams, both nationally but more importantly regionally and locally. So although Nick, Cordo and I meet each other regularly. We don't often have debates about the merits of one strategy versus another. We have real patients to discuss this around and living, breathing examples. So my knowledge is very much about the living, breathing examples and not the science. So we, we've gone through this phase of, of not really understanding what sepsis is and not really understanding what the definition is. And we're moving more and more towards this concept of infection with badness. So the question is, how do you define the badness? PCT has already kind of given us a, a, an, an inroad into that with this concept that it identifies patients with serious bacterial infection, SBI. So it's not a sepsis, it's not septic shock, it's just someone with a serious bacterial infection. It doesn't really identify those with a localised minor infection or necessarily um, to areas like the skin. But it does seem to identify, certainly in my clinical practice, patients that are more at significant risk. And it's not necessarily the risk of mortality, as Cordo has outlined already. It's the amenable arm of treatment to, with antibiotics, those who would respond, those who are likely to have bacterial infection. And we can suppose that if we think about the divisions of where patients end up, Infection in the community, very low mortality, 0.5%. As soon as you cross the threshold, you're at 8% mortality. So if you come into hospital as um, an infection, or SOS as we call it, that's 8%. SBI, probably double that. And then once you reach the true spectrum of sofa-positive sepsis, you're, you're pushing 30. Day-to-day, um, -day, the things I really like, I love blood cultures. Um, I particularly like positive ones. I love it when people have done them and taking a decent amount of blood, but that's the subject of another conversation. Um, I love talking to my colleagues, Cordo and Nick, and the, you know, the whole team every day about patients that worry me. And I have the luxury of having a face-to-face -face with them every day about you know, the 50 patients that are on my ward that I'm, I'm concerned about who might have rip-roaring infection. And that is something we need to be, it needs to be everywhere, really. I, I think of the years I went through clinical practice without that, without the luxury of that. And I know certain wards where they perhaps don't have that service. But um, it is something about the collaboration and the liaison of having a clinical microbiologist who can come and talk to you about your patients, antimicrobial pharmacist as part of the team, and um, you know, having a regular daily occurrence. 
within your areas where patients become sick with infection. We have um, the luxury of rapid point of care tests that again I love because it helps me formulate decisions on very grey patients, patients without definite diagnoses. Um, it sorts the wheat from the chaff out for me. It helps inordinately with, with helping me not give antibiotics in, in times, particularly those who present with flu-like symptoms and relatively flat inflammatory response, but with the news of nine who, in a, in a sane world, would just get first dose with intravenous antibiotics because you're worried about it there and then. You couldn't really exclude it. And, if, you know, a 17-year-old girl presenting with the news of nine very disordered physiology, flu-like symptoms or not, we know that most sensible clinicians will go by the level of acuity to decide whether antibiotics are warranted, even in the face of symptoms like myalgia or coryza, because you, you are worried and justifiably worried. So this is where PCT kind of comes into its own and where we certainly use it. Recent case was that 17-year-old girl with a news of nine that eventually escalated to 11 that we held antibiotics off on because we had a PCT that was negative and a CRP in a white count and a reasonable history. Reviewed her every hour for her observations, gave her fluids, paracetamol. I was dead worried, came back in at about 8 p.m. to check on her because I thought, hmm, better just make sure I've done the right thing here. And the news had dropped to about three with just fluids and paracetamol. So I thought, big sigh of relief. She went home the next day with the news of one. Then, now, it's an example, I suppose, of Sure, CRP in white cell count might have been useful. Would I have believed it? Probably not. Not entirely, because I know the fallacies and falsehoods that CRP in white cell count produce. Her lactate was two. She was a bit crispy, a bit dry. Um, she needed filling, certainly. She wasn't in renal failure. But the point is, it gives you an extra degree of confidence in making some pretty, some decisions that can be viewed as quite brave at times. And the more tests we have like that, the, the more validation we have for that as clinicians, the more we can avoid the antibiotic treatment. Um, in terms of the rest of the, the armorarium of tests, I have the luxury of being able to get a CRP within 15 minutes and a lactate within 10 minutes. We have the urinary antigens. We're doing a wonderful trial of um, rapid point of care flu swabs that are flu plus, that have been really good so far. You'd be pleased to know, Nick. We've had, um, I think, three or four cases recently where we've actually diagnosed flu when it's been point-of-care flu negative. Adenovirus has been cropping up, and it also does an atypical screen. So there is a really exciting role of possibilities that we can, we can explore with these. And obviously urine. Um, I love getting antibiotic choices right first time. I don't think I ever do, but I particularly like it when I really do, um, or the juniors do. Um, it's great when you can actually stop antibiotics as soon as possible when they're not warranted, hopefully within 12 hours as opposed to waiting for the entire 72 on the post-take consultant ward round. Um, and when we can switch from IV to oral, the sooner the better. And discharging patients with proper safety netting for outpatient intravenous antibiotic therapy. So where is your line in the sand as to whether they get better? Cordo eloquently described the fact that there's such a lag with CRP and white cell count, and yet I still see practice day in, day out, with clinicians waiting for the CRP to normalise before they send them home. And you're thinking, do you know how long it takes to get a normal CRP? But it's, it's, it's almost in the culture, so it's going to take a bit to break. But we know the evidence is there. Um, this was a recent case, 37-year-old man, came in with fevers, rigors, night sweats, classic kind of septic kind of presentation. Shivers, looked pretty unwell. His news was six. He was a young, fit man, so quite significant news. No obvious focus of infection. Absolutely no meningism, no abdominal abnormalities, clear chest, certainly not coughing. Um, and his investigations were negative, you know, largely negative. Three sets of blood cultures, normal urine, but a CRP that was about 300, a lactate that was elevated in a white cell count of 19.4. So you knew something was up, but was it inflammatory? Was it infective? Who knows? We investigated into the hill. He had a chest X-ray, ultrasound, CT, chest abdopelvis in the end. HIV was negative all your usual sensible tests. And this is where procalcitonin really helped us because we started them on broad spectrum antibiotics as anyone would do when, with that sort of degree of physiological instability. But an early PCT told us we were barking up the right tree, it told us we should probably continue the antibiotics. So 43 is pretty stonking from a procalcitonin perspective and certainly in the realms of SBI or serious bacterial infection. 
Um, we tailored his antibiotics down a little bit more. We held faith with the antibiotic choice on day two. Again, helped by the PCT not rising further, if anything, coming down a little bit. And by day three, we knew we were onto a winner because his PCT had dropped by nearly f um, to four from 43. So quite a staggering reduction. We eventually got him home another three days later on oral cephalosporins, and he was fine. We never found a source for his definite serious bacterial infection. But I suppose the story for us was his CRP and his white cell count stayed off the scale to the end of his admission. It was the PCT dropping and his normalization of physiology that gave us the confidence to know this is probably what we're dealing with. Now, he may come back in a few months' time with rip roaring spinal abscess, but, you know, and that, that's always in the offing. But, you know, when you don't grow anything and all you've got is inflammatory response in your clinical judgment, that's all you can rely on. His echo was normal as well. It was just an absolute negative case, but so helped by PCT in terms of timeliness of antibiotics, stopping his antibiotics, and obviously the advice we gave him. When you've got patients who come in with DNV who might have gastroenteritis and there's something inside that you're worried about, that it might be a bit more, and, you know, this is all the neck fash cases or toxic shock syndrome cases I've ever seen in my entire life, um, you know, it, it, it becomes down to, are there any other tests that can help you? Because actually a DNV can give you a very, very sick presentation that can be every bit as bad as a sepsis. So this patient came in with a 54-year-old lady with diarrhea, vomiting, news of only fours, so and not particularly disordered. Cat refill time that was around four seconds, so quite dry, but not renal failure. Inflammatory response that was mildly elevated. So again, this gray area, CRP is about 80, 87. White cell count wasn't up. Lactate was a little bit up, but consistent with someone who was dry. Normal radiology. Day, well, day zero, 12 hours afterwards, we thought, hmm, what if this is more than just diarrhea and vomiting? She was a bit kind of not quite right. Not to the point where I'd say she was confused, but I sort of saw her on the post take and thought, you're not quite right. Let's just check a PCT and just see where we are. Lo and behold, 140. Um, she was in a side room on one of our surgical wards. As a, as, you know, DNV, everyone thought, right, isolate her, stick her somewhere. We didn't have any medical um, isolation beds, so she ended up in a surgical ward. You know, absolutely not what you want with a, a sepsis um, secondary to DNV. And, um, you know, as a result of that, we got her on broad spectrum at that point. News had escalated to six by that point. She did end up with an intensive care admission, and 24 hours after that, her CRP finally went up. You know, CRP of 380, white cell count went up to 20. But again, it was the sensitivity. It was the fact that there was a delay that led to the delayed treatment in some ways. Blood cultures eventually grew in meningococcus. Who could have seen that one coming with a DNV presentation? You know, and this is, this is where we, we, we can only be helped. And sometimes, it's the only clue something's up. So we had a patient who was intubated, comatosed, sorry, not intubated, in a coma, um, and had been labelled as having central non-infectious causes of fevers. Has also been immunosuppressed, so intravenous immunoglobulins, methylprednisolone. And um, this is where it does come into its own, because this was a patient who never developed an elevated CRP, never developed an elevated white blood count, did display hallmarks of an inflammatory response, so the escalation score went up, was clearly unwell for one reason or another with fevers, but you know if you're, it's not uncommon to have um, in, in, uh, central related fevers. You know this is not an un, unexpected thing, and when you are honed in into this culture of thinking it's the white cell count I'm going to look out for, it's the CRP I'm going to look out for, you then omit some of the critical other tests, and you know uh, who can say? But perhaps an earlier procalcitonin might have given us the diagnosis sooner. Um, and, you know, before, I suppose, the escalation and the septic shock and all of that developed. So there are many, many examples that certainly I come across day to day where it's, it's been management changing. Um, and, you know, long be the case, we know sepsis is really difficult. At the moment, we lack that gold standard test. And perhaps, as Cordo has alluded to, you know, a marriage of physiology, procalcitonin, and some measure of what clinical judgment represents might be the way forwards. Because even if you're in intensive care and you, you do your sofas and you know what the consensus definitions for sepsis are, there's still an incredible amount of variability in what people define as sepsis, as we know from surveys done on intensive care 
specialists. So there is a need for a gold standard test or one that is as close to it as possible. Thank you.